i hope everyone's enjoying their lunch and it's time for us to pay close attention to our keynote speaker for the luncheon i have one administrative announcement it's important to everybody in all corners of the room as you finish your main course and you're looking for dessert hold that thought your ticket will allow you to have dessert on the floor of the conference after we've completed our lunch and keynote address. So if you'll hang on to your tickets and take them out, then you should be able to enjoy your dessert in the presence of all of our exhibitors. Don't mess it up. We're very fortunate, before I introduce our keynote speaker, to recognize two distinguished Americans, great soldiers, who've honored us with their presence here today. General Bob Cohn, who is the commander of Army Training and Doctrine Command, and General Ray Ordinarino, who, as you know, is the dubious distinction of being the last Joint Forces Commander. Please join me in welcoming both of these general officers. It's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today. He's a 1973 graduate of the Naval Academy before that a Phillips Exeter graduate. I'm not sure, John, but I think you probably have more time on nuclear surface ships than probably any of your peers or anybody in the Navy that I've known about. As a nuclear trained warrior, and I mean that, as a sailor warrior, he has been on almost every one of the types of ships that in the course of the history of the Navy we have made into nuclear power. So uh, his experience there is extensive. He's been the director of the Navy staff He's been a number of other things that you would be interested in if you look at his biography, but there's one thing they don't talk about. He recognizes the changing way that we communicate in the world today. And if you think about it, we've talked a lot about it today, but here's action points. Admiral Harvey, since he was the director of the Joint Staff, has actively participated in the blogs at the Naval Institute and in his own blog, interacting with everyone from midshipmen to chief petty officers, to young officers, in direct commentary back and forth about the issues that confront the Navy today and individual issues that confront folks who want to grow inside the world of being a sailor. When all of us who are my age think back, when we were midshipmen or when we first graduated from college or the academy, the idea that you would be able to speak directly to the Commander of Fleet Forces Command and get a response to your question or your concern blows the mind. And it's an indicator of just how much he's engaged with tomorrow's sailor as part of his trust as Commander of Fleet Forces Command. Please join me in welcoming Admiral John Harvey to the lectern. got the lights right. Well, good afternoon and thank you. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to be here and speak with you today. My boss, General Odierno, great to see you, sir. General Cohn, welcome aboard. Seven days in command of TRADOC, and I'm sure you've got it all figured out right now. We're glad to have you in the neighborhood. Uh, my number one joint partner, this is a joint warfighting conference, so I want to recognize my number one joint partner, Lieutenant General Denny Halick. Commander, Marine Corps Forces Command, Ura Denny, and also an old shipmate, Lieutenant General Chip Gregson, who has showed up today from parts unknown, but uh, my shipmate back in OSD policy when we both had more hair and more life and more future before us there. Great to see you, Chip. And I also want to particularly welcome uh, Lieutenant General Keene. Uh, sir, the last time I saw you was on a number of VTCs and you were down in Haiti and I was up in Norfolk. I was sending you everything we had that floated and you were kind of wondering why are we getting all this stuff, but it seemed to work out okay in the end. Great to see you, sir, and thanks for being here with us. And thanks for what you did during that most difficult time. You led the charge and you did well, sir, very well. Thank you. When I spoke at this conference last year, it was just after the Dow Jones fell off a cliff and plummeted almost 10% in what pundits claimed was a reaction to the economic crisis in Greece and the fear that this crisis would spread throughout Europe and the world. 
A year later, the problems in Greece are now just a byline, no longer the headline. And although their troubles persist, but instead it is our own fiscal situation that is causing instability in the markets, our slow economic recovery, continued deficit spending, insolvent entitlement programs, and even Standard & Poor's recent negative outlook on the credit rating of the United States. But as I stated to you last year, the fact that fear and the uncertainty it creates profoundly impact our economy and security is nothing new. What is new, to me at least, is the certainty that uncertainty is the salient characteristic of the age we're living in. Our stock market's behavior is just one more reminder that what we believe to be true, based on a thorough and honest reading of the evidence at hand, can change in an instant. And all the logical assumptions we made underpinning that view of our reality can be shattered in that same instant. From the devastating earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear crisis in Japan, to the multiple and completely unanticipated ongoing crises in the Middle East, events rarely go according to the script we have written. Protests in Tunisia sparked similar chains of unrest and protest in Yemen, Algeria, Bahrain, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Libya, and Syria. Within four months, there are regime changes in two Arab nations, Tunisia and Egypt, with the significant potential for further regime changes in Yemen, Syria, and Libya. What happens next is anyone's guess. What form of government will eventually replace the regimes in Egypt and Tunisia? Will any of this incredible turbulence lead to more stability in that region? It's impossible to accurately predict the outcome. And once events do settle out in the Middle East, if that long-waited-for day ever arrives, I'm sure we will have other events in other regions of the globe which will present us with new, unexpected, and potentially more dangerous challenges. So given the significant operational, geopolitical, and economic uncertainty, and these most recent remind reminders that it is highly unlikely we will ever come close to predicting the future with any degree of accuracy, what are the key areas where we must focus our intention to ensure our joint force continues to be both ready and relevant? What are the big things in how we deploy and employ the joint force that we must get mostly right or at least not get completely wrong so we can rapidly and effectively adapt and respond to the unpredictable and the unexpected. The nation's, our nation, ongoing fiscal crisis and the impact it has had and will continue to have on our defense budget has prompted the undertaking of a broad strategic review of our national security interests and how we will respond to those interests in the years ahead. This review offers us a golden opportunity to answer the question I just posed to you as well as giving us the opportunity, and this is just as important, to validate and reaffirm the assumptions upon which the viability of our joint force is based. I fundamentally believe the foundation of the joint force is composed of contributing service units that are whole, that is, properly manned, well-trained, fully equipped, and expertly maintained with high-quality soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines who are able to execute all their assigned missions with both confidence and competence. Without forces that are whole, in and of themselves, provided by the services, the substance, the power, and the purpose of the joint force is at risk. Why is this important? Please remember how I began my remarks. Profound uncertainty marked by violent ways of change is the salient characteristic of the age we live in. Last year, I spoke about how we must be able to rapidly adapt to, uh, to succeed in this new uncertain environment. I continue to believe 
that developing and training inherently flexible forces able to rapidly respond to unpredictable events is of the utmost importance in these utterly unpredictable times. Thus, my message today, to be truly adaptable, to really be flexible and agile, we must first ensure the individual elements of the joint force are in fact able to execute their assigned missions and can actually deliver on their design capabilities. This brings me back to my statement that to fully and completely contribute to the joint force as required, the individual services must be properly resourced to deliver whole units able to execute their missions, especially those missions that are service unique. For example, today and every day, our ballistic missile submarines are on patrol in the deep oceans as our nation's continuously deployed and most survivable element of our strategic deterrent force. Our Aegis cruisers and destroyers are providing proven, lethal, and highly mobile ballistic missile defense around the world. And our ships, submarines, and aircraft are safeguarding the global commons, our sea lines of communications through which the lifeblood of our economy still flows, as it has since we have been a nation. Being able to conduct theater-wide anti-submarine warfare, establish sea control whenever and wherever needed, or execute the very wide range of amphibious operations in conjunction with the United States Marine Corps in our unique global expeditionary role. These are but a few of the uniquely naval missions our forces are solely responsible for each and every day, the execution of which when called upon to do so, is absolutely non-negotiable. They are must-dos. And each of these uniquely naval missions are, in their own way, critical enablers for many missions that are assigned to our combatant commanders and their joint forces. So we must, repeat, must, deliver whole units able to execute our service unique missions and we must be able to deliver those forces in an environment in which the operational demand for our forces and the resources which generate and sustain those forces appear to be on rapidly diverging paths. For the Navy, this means we face some very difficult decisions. What non-core or lesser capabilities do we dial down in order to ensure we sustain our critical core competencies? How do we balance the capability of our forces with the need for greater capacity for our forces? How do we deal with the ever-increasing costs of our manpower while ensuring we continue to deliver world-class health care and competitive pay to our sailors? After 10 years of continuous combat, we now know the true cost of a high-quality all-volunteer force, a force that has endured repeated deployments to the combat zone and a very high op-tempo inside and outside the combat zones. How long will we pay that cost to ensure this extraordinary joint force is retained on active duty knowing the op-tempo that surely awaits them in the years ahead. As you have heard by now, the years of plenty are over. We cannot expect more resources each and every year as we have received over the past decade. We just experienced six months of continuing resolutions, and I expect the coming years will bring even more resource challenges and fundamental fiscal uncertainty. Therefore, we must see reality for what it truly is, put the moose on the table, and make the hard choices to determine what we can achieve with the resources we are given. For Navy, we must take the necessary actions to reestablish certainty in the areas we do control. As our Secretary of the Navy recently stated, we've got the best force that we've ever had, but at some point, you have to have more certainty in terms of deployments, in terms of maintenance, in terms of availabilities, 
in terms of training, and this is what we're pointing toward, trying to get that certainty. The first step in giving our forces that certainty that they, they require is establishing a truly sustainable deployment model. During a recent interview, our Undersecretary, Bob Work, said, since 2006, Navy surface combatants, aircraft carriers, and submarines have essentially been operating at a major combat operations level of demand. And the price that the Navy pays for that is in missed maintenance, longer deployments, and this is another big issue. We want to be able to meet the demand in a sustainable way where we can do our maintenance, take care of our sailors and Marines, and make sure that over time we're going to have the force ready when needed. Making the choices today, the choices that Secretary Mabus and Undersecretary Work have just referred to, in order to sustain the force into the future, perhaps means saying no to some things today. So we have the wherewithal to say yes tomorrow when truly vital national interests are at stake. For almost a decade, we have focused on meeting the various COCOM's operational demands at the expense of required training and maintenance. The fleet response plan was originally designed to generate maximum operational availability of naval forces while also creating surge capacity should additional forces be required. Well, we generated that surge capacity and then immediately began consuming it. And that surge capacity slowly became part of our expected operational output. Surge capacity became routine delivery. Since 2005, an average of 50 ships a year violate our personnel tempo red lines to meet our current operational commitments. In 2001, about 6% of our ships failed their in-serve material inspections. By 2009, that number had doubled to about 14%. In addition, only 20% of our ships are now able to complete their basic training on time due to maintenance backlogs, additional training requirements, and unscheduled deployments. For almost 10 years, the Navy has essentially been operating on a demand-driven, vice-supply-limited model. We have to hit the reset button. Over the next three years, we will be transitioning to a model we are calling FRP reset in which we will add certainty to all the areas Secretary Mabus highlighted. Our training schedules, our maintenance periods, our deployment schedules, and our manning levels. Because at some point, the budget stops simply being a math problem. And the hard decisions that are lying in front of us, right in front of us, simply have got to be made. But making the hard decisions concerning what when and where we will dial down is a far better path to follow than to take the path of least resistance, the one we normally follow, and take a percentage cut on all we do, thus guaranteeing we will still try to do everything, only we will do it all less well. Transitioning to a sustainable deployment model is just one step, albeit a very important step, that we can take to ensure we deliver 100% of our essential core capabilities whenever they are needed. On the acquisition side, we're going back to basics to ensure our platforms and weapon systems perform to design specifications. Our interoperable, truly interoperable with our other systems and have the required training and support structure in place up front to ensure we can properly operate and maintain those systems. Additionally, we're taking the necessary steps and making the required resource investments to ensure our forces are properly maintained. The ships and submarines we buy today will be the same ones we have in 20, 30, or even 40 years. We will expect all our carriers to last 50 years, just like my first ship, the USS Enterprise, and to finish at age 50 as strong as when they started. As we reset in stride between each deployment cycle, 
naval forces require a steady and sustained level of resources provided over time. Over the past 10 years, as we have focused primarily on meeting a growing operational demand signal, we did so at the expense of required maintenance and basic training. The Piper will be paid in his time. The results manifested themselves in failed in-serves and reduced service ship life. In addition, we pay a severe penalty when we defer our ship maintenance as delayed maintenance can cost up to 300% more than the original cost, resulting in far less actual maintenance performed for every dollar we spend. In August of 2009, recognizing our growing maintenance and sustainment deficiencies, Admiral Rat Willard, then Commander Pacific Fleet, and I initiated the Fleet Review Panel to identify root causes of the negative material health trends we were experiencing in the fleet and recommend the steps necessary to reverse those trends. It's been 16 months and a very hard slog since the panel completed its report. But I believe, I truly believe, we have begun to reverse the most worrisome trends. We are seeing marked improvements in the material condition of our ships, like the USS Oak Hill, one of our hardworking LSDs, which, although in a very poor material condition just a year ago, recently came through her very demanding in-serve inspection with flying colors. Now make no mistake, we've got a long way to go. But with the continued support of our Congress and the very strong commitment we've had from Secretary Mavis and Admiral Ruffhead, we will certainly get there. At this point, I'm sure some of you may be asking, why all this Navy-specific talk at a joint warfighting conference? Remember my fundamental point today. You cannot, you cannot separate the performance of the joint force from the unique capabilities each service delivers to the joint force. Navy issues, Marine issues, Army issues, and Air Force issues are joint issues. And the challenges and issues that each service must face directly impacts their ability to contribute to the joint force. For too long, for way too long, we have assumed the services are able now and will continue to be able to provide the same capacity and capability that we have in the past. And joint discussions have tended to ignore many issues as too service specific based on that increasingly shaky assumption. Establishing the strong foundation for the joint force is the responsibility of the services and the service force providers. It's our job to ensure this foundation is strong today and tomorrow so the joint force has a solid point of departure for success across the spectrum of conflict. As John Don once wrote, no man is an island entire of itself. Each is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. The same goes for the joint force. We are each part of the greater whole. And before the joint force can be strong and whole, the individual components must be strong and whole. My message to you today is twofold. First, it is clear to me each service is going to have to make some very tough decisions about what they will do to ensure they remain fully ready to deliver their core competencies today and in the future. Given the expected budget environment, we will struggle simply to ha hold on to what we have today. My focus and your focus should be on how do we sustain what we have today into the future. The years of plenty are indeed over, but the range, scope, and severity of the threats we will face and the resultant operational demand for our forces is likely to only increase over the coming years. And I don't see a time ahead where we'll, will we be able to take a training time out to quickly reconstitute and reset the force. It is permanent whitewater ahead, as far as the eye can see or the mind can imagine. 
So in this increasingly resource-constrained environment, where should we place our efforts? How can we sustain our forces and get every ounce of capability from the investments we've already made? How can we evolve our tactics, training, and procedures to counter the new and evolving operational threats, bridge capability gaps, and unlock our forces' full potential? How do we achieve these goals and thus give our combatant commanders the certain force they need in these most uncertain times? These are the questions we must be asking ourselves, and the answers may not be entirely self-evident to us now, but they will be found within the context of the joint force as envisioned by Goldwater Nichols. Since 1987, our military has made significant progress towards maturing how we train and operate as a joint force. Today, our forces train and operate jointly. We are educated in joint doctrine and educated in common joint schools. We are assigned joint experiential tours. And our combatant commanders are able to leverage the combined capabilities of the individual services to execute a wide range of joint operations. These are truly significant accomplishments and are exactly what we should have done given the challenges we faced in 1987 and the challenges that we still face today. But one thing Goldwater Nichols did not do is to relieve the services of their Title X responsibilities. In the Navy's case, we are charged by law to be organized, trained, and equipped primarily for prompt and sustained combat incident to operations at sea, operations that will primarily take place within the structure of the joint force. We must never forget the fundamental truth that our ability to fully leverage the joint force and sustain that force into the future requires maintaining the core competencies of the individual services. For the joint force, to fulfill the promise of Goldwater Nichols, each service must ensure their forces are properly manned, well-trained, fully equipped, and expertly maintained, able to execute the full range of assigned missions with confidence and competence. And in so doing, we will guarantee that the foundation upon which our extraordinary joint force is built and from which it will evolve, remain strong, and fully capable of supporting the demands of the nation in these uncertain, turbulent, and still most dangerous of times. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time and your attention. I've been informed that I have time for questions, so I'd be happy to take any that may come up, or almost any. Good afternoon, Admiral uh, Captain Doug Swanson. Uh, just a quick question. You mentioned the FRP and, and some of the results from that. Can you translate or comment at all on the results of that pertaining to network readiness, IT readiness? Has there been anything that's come out of that very specific to, to that domain? Thank you, sir. So the question is, as we work the FRP, what has come out that is specific to Cyber Command and our IT networks? Is that it? Give me a head nod. Okay. Uh, no. Well, I mean, but it brings up a very good point. Uh, you say the cyber domain, uh, we often refer to it that way, but I don't think you can separate that out from the fundamental war fighting issues that come up as we look at across the force. Uh, we don't set you aside separately and say, we'll deal with you, then we'll deal with you, and we'll do with you. This is a coherent whole we have to bring together, kind of the point of what I was talking about. And in the fleet response plan, we don't set the Cyber Forces Command or NetWarCom aside. We have to bring it in and make sure what we're doing with you all fits what we're doing with the ships, with the submarines, 
and, and with the aircraft as we build the deploying unit. So we don't separate it out. It's going to impact all of us. It's going to impact all of us in the future for a few more years, and it'll be done in a coherent way, not in a separate community-by-community community way. Admiral Nancy Brown. Um, I'd like to ask a question about um, organizing, and as you talked about the service's Title X responsibilities to organize, to provide force to that joint commander. And we've seen the Navy go through a lot of changes in the last uh, year and a half, standing up 10th Fleet, taking that WARCOM and breaking it into two different commands. And I'm just wondering, from your perspective as the uh, fleet commander, um, do we have that organization about right, or are we still tweaking that? Well, I think we're still tweaking. I believe yesterday we gave a presentation here about the change that's going to be coming our way at Fleet Forces. Uh, lost in the announcement that the Secretary of Defense made about the disestablishment of Joint Forces Command was also kind of the side note that we're going to be combining uh, Second Fleet and Fleet Forces Command and then disestablishing Second Fleet. The goal for that, for, for my purpose, whether it's dealing with our Marine Corps uh, partners or anyone else that we deal with operationally, is that on the outside, when you look in and what you get from the Navy today, from Fleet Forces, from Second Fleet, that the day after we disestablish Second Fleet, you don't see anything different coming your way. What you had then, you'll have now. The people will be the same. The relationships will be the same. The habitual relationships we've built up over time with the Coast Guard in terms of maritime defense, uh, maritime defense and maritime domain awareness, with the Marine Corps and how we prepare our ARG Muse to go forward. I'm very hopeful that with the stress we put on how we're bringing this together, that you won't see operationally any difference, any impact on what this change brings. As far as establishing 10th Fleet, I think it has brought great clarity and focus to how we view all things cyber. Back to the point I made to Captain Swanson. We were in danger of kind of splitting up these domains that we talk about so glibly. The uh, aviation, the air domain, sea, air, space, and cyber, under the water, on the water, over the water. Uh, you got to view this stuff in a coherent way. It is one war fighting problem that you have to come at and solve. And so to split out all the communities and deal with each one separately, I think, is the way of madness. I think in establishing 10th Fleet, we brought the focal point together so he can apply all those issues to our war fighting concerns, our operational plan, how we bring our systems to our ships, and how we use them once they get to the ship. So I see these things as a step forward, Nancy, and I'm glad to be here when we're doing them. It's, it's, it's painful sometimes being in the midst of this creation, but I think we're going to be okay with the results when, it, when we're all said and done here. Hey, sir, uh, Danny Haley, thanks for your remarks. And uh, you and I have discussed this a little bit. I wonder if you would uh, share with us all, uh, how are we going to satisfy uh, the requirement and the desirement of the COCOMs uh, as they continue to ask for uh, deployed naval forces, both Navy and Marine Corps? And along with that, sir, to balance that with your FRP re reset program, which is so critical in order for us to deploy, and then to make sure that both as a naval force, uh, Marine Corps and Navy, uh, we get back to our core competencies. Well, I mean, that's the key thing here, is how do you have a discussion with uh, uh, geographic combatant commanders, all of whom who have been charged by the President through the Secretary of Defense to carry out a tremendous level of specific activities, preparation for various operational plans, be able to respond to various war plans, and maintain during the non-operational periods, if you will, non-combat periods, a vigorous engagement plan throughout their theaters. There's an insatiable and inexhaustible demand for the forces that you and I supply. Uh, there's no easy way to get at it. There's got to be a conversation. There's got to be a very powerful conversation. And, but it's got to be, that conversation has to take place with the full knowledge of what the realities facing the services are. Right now, my personal belief, it's been very much of a one-way conversation. It's obviously driven by the fact we've been engaged in conflict, real conflict, on the ground in Afghanistan, Iraq. That's the fight you got to win, and everything goes to win that fight. We all get that. But then there's other things going on out in the world, too. 
that are creating these demand signals. And we haven't really, in my view, have we prioritized them across the COCOM. I mean, they're each doing what they've been told to do, and I have no beef with that. My issue is with the system where we bring it together and say, okay, here it all is. Here's what we've got to do it. They don't mix. They don't add up. You've just simply got to deal with that. And as we start going into this environment where you and I are going to have about 5 to 10 percent less next year than what we had this year, that becomes a really important question for our bosses to answer. So, Danny, I wish I had the right answer for you. You and I know what the right answer is. Uh, I got to convince some other people that it's the right answer. But the important thing is that there's got to be a mechanism. How do we bring these combatant command demands together? Not just in a way of getting to the GIF map, the global force management process, but the long haul. How do we sustain this force so that our ships do last for 20 and 30 years? Because it's a lot cheaper to keep them that long than to buy new ones every 10 or 15 years. This is what's really at heart, the sustainment of our forts for the future. Because with everything else, we're not going to have the funds to re-procure the force at the rate we have in the past. So we're really caught on this one. But the answer is going to be a very, very hard, realistic look at the demand signal, what we have to respond to that demand signal, and how we bring those two into consonance. Admiral Dick Diamond, uh, down from Newport, Rhode Island. One way to increase our uh, ability to deal with limited resources is to be smarter and act more efficiently. Another way is to get trusted and capable allies to shoulder part of the burden. The new maritime strategy has a pillar that talks about cooperative maritime security, and we've made some progress, but a lot of work still lies ahead. What do you think still needs to be done in terms of legislation, changing procedures, changing attitude to make our international partners more willing to sign up, more capable to contribute, and more easily uh, having access to our technology and being fully interoperable with our forces? Well, I can't give you the specifics on the legislation. I can tell you I think I have learned an awful lot over the last three years from our piracy, our counter-piracy operations that have been going on in the Indian Ocean. I mean, it just absolutely fascinates me. We have sat there when we started, to, when we really started reacting strongly to the increasing disruption of the trade routes off of Somalia, up through the Straits of Bab el Mandeb, and out now reaching to the shores of India. Uh, I saw a number of nations come together. First, of course, we had our forces, our naval forces, our U.S. forces assigned to uh, naval uh, nav sent in Central Command. They responded. Then uh, the European Union set up Operation Atalanta and sent forces down under the flag of the European Union, individual European nations responding. We had NATO engagement. And then, by God, we have the Russians, the Chinese, the Iranians have sent ships. About 32 different nations have responded through various means, either spontaneously or in conjunction or in some kind of a partnership uh, arrangement with the United States to set up a force, a coherent force that is actually having an impact off the coast of that misbegotten nation that is lending so much uh, trouble to the maintaining stability in our sea lanes. Now, what legislation set that up? None. It was a coalition of the willing. This was the, what Admiral Mullen started calling the Thousand Ship Navy, which we morphed to the Cooperative Maritime Strategy, which has morphed to, we're here, come on down, there's things we can do, we can make it work as we have in naval forces for years and years. We get together and we figure it out. Nations that won't talk to each other at the UN, we figure it out off the coast of Somalia and work effectively together. And I think there's just going to be a lot more of that in our future, Dick. You can't legislate it, you can't mandate it, you just respond to the need, you make clear that there's an opportunity here and that there's room to operate together. That's what we've done in the past. We're learning how to do it better, and I think that's where, where we have to continue to go. Thank you. Afternoon, Admiral. Uh, Ken Karkrip down from NAVAIR. And I had a question on piracy, so I'll do a follow-up question to the one you just answered. It looks like right now that, uh, uh, actually not looks like, but General uh, Carter Ham said a couple weeks ago that there is now indications or at least some percentage that money is coming or going with the Islamic terrorism that's coming out of piracy. 
We've seen the model change from what we used to say was a business model. They've killed hostages now. Ransoms dramatically increasing. Ransoms being paid and the hostages not being returned. Uh, from a maritime perspective, uh, it's just becoming a, a, another front in a war in terrorism. It's more than just a you know, counter piracy that we're doing. You talked about some things or, you know, what's the next step and, and where, do, where do you see us going uh, over this as, as the threshold increases and, the, and obviously what they're doing certainly has is, is escalated quite a bit. Well, I think what we saw was the, what began as the work is a few disgruntled fishermen who didn't have any better prospects and saw a lot of their livelihood disappearing before their eyes went out and took this route. Uh, it has since become seen to be good business and that good business has become big business. Uh, the networks that control the piracy now stretch far beyond Somalia. They have ties now with a variety of terrorist organizations. It has all come together in Somalia and it impacts us out to the shores of India and uh, up, up into the Red Sea and further down south uh, in, in, along the coast of Eastern Africa. So this thing has spread, it is a big business now and has morphed and will continue to morph. And our tactics, techniques, and procedures are going to have to morph as well. Uh, they're getting more sophisticated. They're getting more violent, uh, as we have seen over the past year or so. Our responses are picking up proportionally. And I'm hopeful that the rules of engagement that we have, now remember, there are very many different nations playing in this same sandbox here. So you have an awful lot of different rules of engagement you have to negotiate. But I'm, I'm slowly seeing that our ability to respond rapidly and increasingly effectively to what we see there, I'm, I'm very, feeling pretty positive about where we are with that. But this is getting bigger. It's going to continue to grow. Fortunately for the United States, the actual economic impact on us directly is still uh, quite small. Uh, if you go and uh, listen to the folks from MERSC talk about it, who have a very significant stake in the game, you will see that beyond some rerouting of some of their uh, of some of their big container ships, it really has an impact on them, and it has an impact on this nation. But there are a number of nations in Africa where it's had an extraordinary impact in terms of the delivery of relief supplies, where people who are literally starving, their food's not getting there; it's being it's being held up, robbed, and taken out and sold. So the, the impact is is big; it's growing, not on us. But I think we have the ability to respond. We have the duty to respond and we're responding in kind, and that will continue for the next, for the next few years, I'm sure. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me again in thanking Admiral Harvey for his presentation and for the Q&A session. We're grateful to have you with us, sir. I'd invite all the conferees to, to adjourn to the conference floor with your tickets for your dessert and announce that at 2 o'clock, uh, the Honorable Linton Wells will lead a panel on assistance in Haiti and Pakistan and how the military is supporting in relief roles. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>